Um, the final session is going to be a panel discussion. Um, it's going to look at step three, which was around being able to create a commercial manufacturing base and the all important supply chains. And the panel discussion is um, uh, driven by a, a sugar beet working group uh, panel. And they're going to talk about um, the role of agriculture in and sustainable farming in the bioeconomy um, and what we need to uh, really get this project off the ground. So I am going to uh, hand over to Ian Riddle, who is the chair of the session and also principal consultant at SAC Consulting. Hello, my name is Ian Riddle of SEC Consulting, part of SRUC, and I'm the facilitator and coordinator of the Sugar Beet Project. I'd firstly like to introduce our panel today. We have Hugh, Adams, Hugh Campbell Adamson and Gordon Cairns, uh, the owner and farm managers of Stracathra Estate. We have uh, Derek Stewart of James Hutton Institute and Ian Archer of iBioIC. First of all, I'd like to give you a short introduction to the project and what we've done to date. Reintroducing sugar beet to Scotland is a bold objective, but it's one that our group has very much bought into. The crop was actually grown in Scotland from 1926 uh, through a plant in Cooper Fife for refining for sugar up until production ceased in 1972. Now, 50 years later, we have plans to reintroduce the crop in eastern Scotland, this time to produce ethanol for industrial purposes, both as a fuel additive and for various plastic products. So our main goal is to decarbonise part of Scottish industry by reducing reliance on fossil fuels and also to provide a new crop for farmers. Now, I first heard of the plan when Scottish Enterprise approached RIS, the Rural Innovation Support Service. RIS provides a facilitator to help a group, mainly farmers, draw up a plan to take an innovative idea forward. It helped that Scottish Enterprise had already commissioned the National Non-Food Crop Centre to prepare a feasibility study in 2019, which had been broadly positive of reintroducing sugar beet to Scotland. So I worked with iBioIC and JHI to do the groundwork and set up the risk group. How did we start? We held an open meeting in Dundee last February to spread the word and were delighted when 46 people, farmers, co-op leaders, agronomists and consultants, many people from the agricultural industry turned up and were broadly positive about the idea. However, we all recognise the challenge is daunting. Although we know farmers can grow the crop and the refinery process is relatively simple technology, we need to find a large amount of capital investment for plant and infrastructure. And most importantly, we need to convince many farmers on some of the best land in Scotland to grow the crop. And they'll only do so if the price is right and they can lock into a long-term arrangement. And on our group, we've been fortunate to pull together a great group with diverse knowledge that has met regularly since March 2020. This includes farmers already growing sugar beet for anaerobic digestion plants who have trialled the crop at four locations, as have GHI. We've got chemical industry expertise from iBioIC and also from GHI. We have cooperative experience from SAOS and a vegetable co-op. And we've also people with strengths in communications and industry leadership, important for getting our story across and influencing key people in industry. So what are our next steps? Uh, the next immediate step is to conduct a detailed study that builds in the NNFCC report and looks at is our specific situation. This will help us assess if the idea can work and also give us the figures and confidence to approach investors, government, and also get farmer engagement. I'd like to finish the introduction with two main points. Uh, from a farmer's point of view, we'd like to form a co-op that gives our farmers professional management and a, a stronger say in negotiations. And we'd also like to see farmers get some credit for industrial carbon savings um, to be retained by farmers, be this through price or another form of support. So now I'd like to move on to some questions. And uh, my opening question is for, uh, for our panel, it's for Ian Archer. So far in this session, we've heard about plans for scaling up activity in Grangemouth and how we can kickstart the growth of the bioeconomy in the central belt of Scotland. How does sugar beet play into this? 
I think, well, all manufacturing needs a feedstock and ultimately most of the products we're interested in, in making are carbon based and that carbon usually comes from oil. So bio-based manufacturing to, as an alternative um, requires a bio-based feedstock. Ultimately, that's going to be carbon dioxide tracked out of the air via plants at some point. Um, we're good at, as we've heard in this session already, we're good at R&D, bio-based R&D in Scotland. We've heard about the plans for the Falkirk region through Caroline's um, presentation earlier. Um, but if we want to manufacture in Scotland and scale up to manufacturing level, we need a local feedstock. We have companies in our network who have done all of their R&D in Scotland. They've done their piloting work here, but they can't manufacture because there is no feed due to the lack of that feedstock. I mean, ideally, that would be sugar. And here in Scotland, the outstanding choice for that would have to be sugar beet. Um, but really those opportunities, I would say, are relatively small to get farmers engaged and excited. Um, but we do have one very large demand for sugar um, or for sugar based products here, sugar, -derived, sugar derived products here, and that's ethanol. We currently import over 50 million litres of ethanol um, from France um, made from French sugar beet. We can do all of that in Scotland. We've grown sugar beet here before. We currently grow some now. Um, and I think that will allow us to create jobs, allow that farming industry to support net zero while creating a really robust local supply chain. But for me, the really exciting opportunity is that creating that initial sugar supply chain for ethanol is going to stimulate other companies to create a new bio-based chemical industry in Scotland. Thank you, Ian. So it's very much a case of build it and they will come. Um, so we have um, a demand here already. There is already a demand for ethanol. So the the we we can reshore an, an ethanol supply chain, and then that provides the fee the uh, the opportunity for other companies to come along and tap into that supply chain. Okay, thanks, Ian. I'll move on to a question for Hugh from Strakathra Estates. Hugh, how do you see farm farmers delivering sustainability, <laughs> and how can they be crop producers and custodians or guardians of Scottish wildlife and environment at the same time? Thanks, Ian. Um, just a little bit of background. We farm in North Angus on good arable land. I made a decision before Gordon came to hire cattle. We changed our rotations to put more wheat in. It may have been more profitable, but it's done an awful lot of damage. Now with the digest, we now grow grass again, and we also, as you'll hear, we grow sugar beet. It's changed our soil structure dramatically and I think it begins to make sense of where farming should go back to. Put bluntly, in the last 30 years or in the last 50 years since the war, we've lost, they reckon, one third of our topsoil. We're losing five million tonnes of topsoil a year down our rivers, simply because we're farming so badly. We've moved on from putting proper humus into the ground, just putting artificial fertiliser we're taking straw off from wheat and we're just basically doing a lot of damage. I'm lucky enough to own land. I have a son who will be taking over. I hope that will keep going, not so much for the family, but for the land, because as some expression says, you, you know, it's a brave man who plants a tree for his grandson to sit underneath. But I think all farmers should be looking that way. We've been far too short term. And the one big, big problem I have is we have been encouraged through subsidies to grow commodities. Just commodity, grow wheat, grow wheat, grow bar. The end user is never known to the farmer directly. We've got to get out of that. We've seen what's happened with Brexit. We've seen the recent problems with exporting, bringing stuff in from abroad, it's coming more difficult. And here we are, I think, having a chance at last to absolutely nail the problem of having to import stuff and at the same time, if we can do something in Scotland, we can do such a lot of good for our land. Thanks very much, Hugh. Uh, continuing the, the farming theme, I'll move on to Gordon Cairns, the farm manager at Strakathro. Gordon, uh, how can farmers contribute to overall climate ambition and how much the sustainability feature in your decision making around sugar beet on your farm? Yeah, thank you, Ian. And, uh, well, I, I'd hope through this project that, that farmers will be able to contribute considerably to the, the climate to change and decarbonisation of, of road transport and, and fuels. Uh, and, and as Hugh said, everything we do as Strakathra here is geared on and about sustainability. I mean, moving 
away from producing commodity crops. And, and this idea of, of growing the beet it gives us a hopefully a profitable break crop. And the, the Scottish agriculture is really needing a, a, a good break crop, uh, something else to give us that, that uh, break the cycle of growing continuous cereal crops or, or continuous root crops. So we need something else in there. Uh, one of the big problems, that, and, and Hugh touched on that as well, is the soil degradation and erosion. And I think growing beet as a root crop as opposed to other, other root crops that we're growing, it doesn't need the same rigorous preparation of the soil. It doesn't do the same structural damage to the soil when it's been prepared. And because it's harvested over a longer period of time, we actually have a lot of ground cover over the winter period when there's high rainfall periods. So you, do, you potentially don't get that same runoff and, and, and uh, erosion from uh, as you would do from early harvested potatoes, for instance, when the, the soil is left bare all winter. So I think the, the, the beet crop fits nicely into that, that we, we have a crop that's suitable for Scottish climates. And, and also the, the one thing for using this as a industrial product and, and the end product from that may well come back onto the farm. So there's, there's really no, no waste. We have the, the potential to bring some of that the byproduct back onto the farm and use it as a soil enhancer or a fertilizer as well. So that, that creates that cycle where everything's not getting lost from the soil and we're able to put something back into soil rather than if you sell wheat, it, you, you, all the nutrients that are used to growing the wheat are gone, they're, they're lost from the farm. So I think that's, we've got to bear in mind the, the bigger picture on, on, on keeping these nutrients in, in, the, in the cycle as well. So I think the, the, the beet crop goes a long way towards that. Uh, the, the other thing that growing it as, as an industrial crop rather than growing other root crops for, for supermarkets and such like, that should, there should be virtually no waste. So that, that has to be good for the, for the, the, the environment as well, because the, the whole crop will be usable. There's no offtakes because the, the, the carrots are wonky or, or dirty or don't look the right shape. So I, I think the, the beet crop in the whole has a lot to offer both for the farm, but also for the, for the environment and, the, and, the, and the, the, the soil that it's grown in. Okay, thanks very much, Gordon. Um, another question for you, focusing on the crop. Can you tell us how sugar beet is already being used in farming? Yes, see, the, the, it's, as I say, the, the, with the demise of the beet factory uh, all those years ago, that hasn't been a major crop in Scotland, but there always has been a certain amount growing as fodder for, for livestock. And over the last few years, with the, the more AD plants that, as we have here at Sokathio, we've been growing beet uh, for, for that market. And yes, and it grows very well in Scotland. We've been quite successful. The new varieties are, are you know, frost hardy, they, they, they yield well. And I think there's potential there to breed. The, the plant breeders are moving on and, and, and producing varieties that will grow well in, in Scottish, Scottish conditions. Um, it's, it's worked well for us and again, as I've touched on before, it, it's allowed us that uh, great crop that gives us a profitable crop. So, so that one of the big things about being sustainable is, is you have to be profitable as well. And uh, hopefully with the beet as well as, as we have had before, we can tie into some sort of long term pricing structure, whereas you're not at the vagaries of the world markets or, or, or selling commodities. Mm -hmm. So bonus for, for, for farming as, as well as having the industry you know, has a uh, the, 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 the crop there that they can draw on, but it, it's just tied into some sort of pricing structure. So it does work well for us. Uh, and the um, I, th I think that the, the advantage for us, and, and it hopefully it will tie in with the, 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 the when you sell it off for, for, for sugar production as well, that because we are supplying it to the AD plant, we are getting all the benefit of coming back. So the end product from the AD plant comes back into land again. And I think that's important. We don't want to lose sight of that, that it's all about breaking these nutrients back into the cycle as well. So, so yeah, it does work. And I think it's something that uh, we should go forward with and, and Scottish farmer will benefit from it. Thanks very much, Gordon. Uh, moving to Derek Stewart of JHI, how does this project fit into the world of agricultural innovation? Um, I think people view agriculture as lacking in innovation. And actually, Gordon's just mentioned aspects of it. I mean, the introduction and development of anaerobic digestion as a process within agriculture is a great example. I and mean, you just need to walk into your supermarket now and compare it with 30 years ago. 
there's agricultural ag uh, innovation right in front of you. But agriculture is seeing different drivers now, as are most sectors. So with um, climate change, we need to be producing to uh, producing sustainably. And all the sectors that have fossil fuel feedstocks are having a shift to sustainable feedstocks. If you look at just the, the mass, the mass balance of what goes on in those sectors, the only sector that can deliver feedstocks sustainably to them is agriculture. End of. And so this all opens up a massive opportunity for agriculture. Um, we're not we're not bringing in a new crop, as Gordon had said. We grew sugar beet well into the 70s. So what we'll see is a resurrection of, a, of an existing crop, but agriculture at the genetics level has evolved. So we've got new varieties that perform better um, and they should deliver higher yields going forward. So we're trialing them now. What we also want to do is innovate on processing the sugar beet and try and do microprocessing much more on farm level. So values captured right down at the production level. And, and what we've got now is an opportunity to create uh, a supply and value chain that is much more equitable. So everyone gets a good share of um, a good return in revenue across the piece. So innovation here is not just on the agri level, there's the process level and also the business model level. Looks like a bright future, I think. Good, thanks Derek. Now a question for both Ian and Derek. What role does biotechnology play here? How does agriculture and big science fit together? Do you want to go first, Ian? Well, I'll kick in first, actually. I okay. mean, it's interesting, if we're talking about biotech, because we're producing a sugar crop and then converting it to bioethanol, you're using the oldest form of biotech there's ever been, the, the, the development of alcohol. I think most, I would imagine, 90 odd percent of your audience will be familiar with that process and be engaging with its products shortly thereafter. Um, the interesting bit here, I think, is progressing that onto the complex chemicals, and Ian's going to talk about that. Yeah, and that's, uh, so I would have said the immediate opportunities for us and, and, uh, and our sector, well, as I mentioned before, we have, we have companies within our membership who are developing new processes by really modern high-tech uh, engineering of, of microorganisms so they can convert a sugar into some kind of interesting product. You know, one of the most obvious ones would be that the perspex, the plastic that my uh, that my glasses are made out of. Um, but there's loads of others here. You know, fuels are another option. Fuels are a, a one that where we already have an existing demand for bio-based bio -based fuels, other chemicals. But there's some really interesting areas, things like, you know, mycelia um, being converted into building materials. So, you know, growing growing the, the, the materials that we can use for construction, um, for clothing, you know, people, people are looking at, at vegan leather, for example. So you can, you can put that sugar through a process and, and, and make a material that, that, that performs as well as, as traditional leather. Uh, I was at a meeting last year where, I was, where um, the North Face, North Face clothing company were presenting a, a jacket that was made from, uh, from synthetic spider silk from this area. So there's lots of different areas that we can get into here. And that's the opportunity that we will be uh, manufacturing in those areas um, is what we, we, we offer the potential for by, by bringing this supply chain into Scotland. And we can guarantee that without this, we will never be a manufacturing com country. Uh, in this space without some kind of supply chain. It's absolutely certain that R&D uh, is, is going to end up uh, exporting, or taking its manufacturing abroad um, because it can't be done locally. Um, so we're not guaranteeing it will happen here, but we provide the opportunity for it to happen in Scotland if that supply chain is in place. Okay, thank you. You've all provided very compelling answers and it's obviously an exciting opportunity. A final question to each of the panellists. Where do you think we'll be in 10 years time? And I'll start with Hugh. Um, I hope very much, I, with my control, I'll probably not be around, but um, in 10 years time, I hope very much we are able as farmers to grow a better, di a, a better diverse number of crops. One part I do feel very strongly about, it has to be locally done. If in some way, and I don't really understand your process, but it includes local production, that's good. We've got to get back to the idea of being localised and get away from commodity market. Okay, Gordon. Yeah, I, I, I just uh, uh, Julia endorse that. I think in ten years' time, it's, it's good to think that we will have uh, an industry that's evolved with a, a willing buyer for our product right on our doorstep. Uh, three of the vacancies of the world market, 
And I think on that would go a long way to helping Scottish agricultural PLC be, be uh, in the drive to being carbon neutral, and that's that's exciting. Derek. Um, I think we'll see a, a nascent industry starting and we'll have a sustainable agricultural industry that's feeding into it. And hopefully all of that together will see Scotland viewed as the place to be developing sustainable feedstocks. Thank you. And Ian? I think our immediate next steps in this project are engaging with uh, investors and operators to get this, to get the ball rolling here, to get something, to get, get real steel on the ground um, and, and, and this supply chain in place. In 10 years time, uh, I don't want to see any more imports of ethanol from anywhere outside of Scotland um, and we should be making all of that ethanol that we need locally while protecting our land in the way that Gordon and, and Huey have described um, and I hope we'll have a, a burgeoning bio-based chemical industry that's growing alongside the existing chemical industry here in Scotland. Okay thanks and I think what I'd like to see probably echoes what Gordon said is um, a, a strong co-op of farmers all participating in this um, maximising, you know, their profitability from a fixed price that they can rely on, which would be excellent moving forward. Okay, thanks very much to all our panel. I think we've covered a lot of ground and some excellent answers. If any of the audience have any questions, I think the best thing to do would be to contact Ian Archer, who you probably know, um, email or contact Ian Archer, and he can get the questions to the rest of the panel and provide an answer. But thanks very much to all the panel, and I hope everyone in the audience enjoys the rest of the conference. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for that panel session. That was really interesting and it provoked a lot of questions and I see that Derek Stewart would like to answer one of them live and that's a question from Sarah, which is, what is the attitude of farmers Scotland-wide to embracing eco or sustainable farming? Over, over to you, Derek. Um, well, speaking from the James Hutton Institute perspective, we engage with the farming community um, on, a constant, on a daily basis. Um, they are already stewards of the environment and <laughs> they see going forward as continuation of that job. Um, they want to leave the land in a better state than they were gifted it or bought it. Um, so I, th I think that's part and parcel of that. We're starting to see transformative change and the embracing of things like the circular economy, reusing waste for better things, it's all a large part of it's what farmers have already done, but it's actually now we're starting to bolt on things like biotech and new chemical technologies, you can start to create some really interesting and valuable products. Great, thanks very much, Derek. Um, we are sort of short on, on time. Some of the questions have been answered, but and we hopefully we can get some additional answers to the people that have put up some very, very pertinent questions. So thank you for that. Um, just to wrap up this session, um, I hope you've all, like me, learned something new about what's going on in Scotland, about building our bioeconomy um, across the three steps from R&D support right through to commercial manufacture and building a supply chain. Um, I'm re reflecting back on what Terry Ahern said yesterday um, from SEPA around Scotland being um, you know, big enough to be taken seriously, uh, but small enough to be nimble. And, and I think the things that are going on really are testament to that. Um, but most importantly, this will only work if through collaboration between academics, researchers, investors um, and skills and training from our, our education establishments. But I think working together, we're in a very good position to continue to accelerate our bioeconomy and uh, chase that net zero target. 